just tell us very briefly a little bit about yourself, what brings you here, um, your personal involvement in DeFi, and in its simplest form, what DeFi means to you. Sam, please kick us off. Yeah, I'm Sam Bankman Fried. I'm the co founder and CEO of FTX, a global cryptocurrency exchange. Um, and, you know, we're really excited to be, uh, you know, building one of our homes here, uh, in, you know, in Dubai. Um, I, you know, I think for me, DeFi, I can mean a lot of different things, but at, at its core, it, it's what happens when you use a blockchain, not just to transfer assets around from one place to another, but when you actually build programs, smart contracts, applications directly into a blockchain, you know, whether it's an exchange that you're building a bar lending protocol. Um, or something you know much more complicated than either of those. Uh, Charles, I'll come to you next. Hi, I'm Charles Hoskinson, Chief Executive Officer of Input Output. We were uh, in the neighborhood here in Dubai, so we figured why not. Uh, DeFi to me is kind of a marriage of traditional finance with uh, new concepts like smart contracts, blockchain technology, decentralized identity and asking how those concepts can be applied to global markets instead of siloed regional markets. Thank you, Rich. Hi, it's, um, it, it's good to be here. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, DACM. We're a, a global institutional family office manager of capital through the crypto space. We specialize in coins and tokens. Uh, and I came to this space after 20 years as a, as a technology and media banker at uh, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. Uh, to me, DeFi is really um, the intersection of technology or new technology with a very old and slowing pace of innovation in the traditional finance world. So it's a way particularly for younger generations to reimagine how finance could work um, and using technology to bring it more into a domain that they understand and, and to offer them services and utility uh, at the speeds, uh, at the innovation and at the levels of engagement that they're more used to dealing with in all other aspects of their life. And finally, Pierre, and small bit of housekeeping, I should have mentioned the top, Pierre uh, will largely be answering in French. Good morning, and thank you so much for the invitation. I am deputy of the National Assembly in France. I work since 2017 on the different crypto active questions. France was one of the first countries to start a legislation and to implement the legislation. So the subject uh, on the subject of crypto active, for me, it's a technology that would uh, create a revolution in the world. It allows uh, to the human um, being to give great potential uh, with, and to have its own actives or its own goods. Uh, today, it's a new era in finance that will structure tomorrow's economy and uh, uh, policies will either integrate it and need to integrate it and uh, to adopt it as is. So to kick off the discussion, um, I think, from a, we'll start with regulation and hopefully build out from that. Um, Sam, I'm going to come to you first. Um, in terms of where we are going with with regulation, often it's there's a lot of the SEC, for example, is a very good example of a regulatory body that's maybe um, seeing how it might be able to regulate uh, what is largely a, a space that there's, is going to be very new to them, moving very quickly, and so on. Um, so if you could tell me, um, how would you say, in your words, could um, regulators keep up with DeFi? It's a good question. And, you know, I, I think that regulators are, as of now, trying to grapple with how to regulate centralized cryptocurrencies and, and, and centralized uh, new cryptocurrency applications. So I, I think that we're a little ways away from DeFi hitting the forefront, um, on, on, you know, and, and, and I, I do think that it's going to be a challenge to figure out exactly how to handle it because it is fairly different from how uh, regulars have traditionally viewed spaces, given the lack of any centralized party um, that, you know, is sort of mediating um, much of the activity. And so in some cases, it's not even clear who is getting regulated. Um, that being said, you know, if I had to take some guesses at where it would be going, um, I, I think the first things you're going to see, first of all, are regulation around, uh, you know, centralized UIs that people use to access DeFi, right? So even if a protocol is decentralized, if someone's hosting a website that 
has you know technology that makes it easy to access and sort of generates orders or or, or other things to submit to that protocol, um, those UIs are going to see you know regulatory scrutiny. And then I, I think that the the second thing that we're going to see a lot of early scrutiny on um, is going to be uh, you know basically the the various um, there are nexuses where I uh, where people can convert between cryptocurrencies and fiat currencies, and you know I think we're already seeing a lot of scrutiny on that um, on the exchange angle. I think we're going to continue to see that on the DeFi angle as well over time. So those would be my guesses about where sort of regulation is going to be coming, um, you know, first, and I think it's going to trickle through to other places over time as their regulatory frameworks are worked out, but there's a lot of really open questions about how, you know, regulators will handle a, a, a space without any party that is, uh, you know, actually um, enacting a transaction. Thank you, Sam. Um, and then to, to go from, the, from, from that point, Charles, I'll go to yourself for the next question. Um, where do regulators go then if there's no centralized entity? How do they do know who they're directing their inquiries to? Who's, whose door are they going to go and knock on? Well, it's an interesting question, but it presupposes that there's truly something as a completely decentralized entity. Uh, and right now in the industry, we have very poor ways of measuring decentralization in general. So when you look at canonical DeFi applications, whether it be a DEX or an Oracle or a stablecoin, in many cases, there's some form of foundation or custodial organization. And uh, these, in many ways, have special privileges, access, or control over the protocols, either to lower operating costs or resolve something that they can't solve uh, with the initial protocol design. Now, the hypothesis is, however, that that's a temporary state of affairs. So over a period of time, five years, 10 years, 15 years, eventually you can askew or completely remove these actors. And as a result, now it's completely decentralized. At that point, regulation gets pushed from the notion of a central actor to regulation at the transaction level and at the edges. And to Sam's point, it's much more functional in that sense. It's where are you getting liquidity from? How are you transforming this? Uh, at what point do you interface with those assets or activities with regulated actors? And that's where you generally would apply the KYC or AML. The other thing is algorithmic regulation is becoming a very vogue topic. So in many transactions, you can carry on the wire a DID or metadata or some artifact that can allow compliance. And then you can put hooks in smart contracts and other such structures to basically have contingent settlement, meaning the settlement is compliance and you get proofs for that. So there's a big market for this and that we're kind of in the, in the gangly, terrible teens of the space. We're about 13 years in and we're starting to ask real questions that go beyond aspiration to practical considerations of how do you attach things like identity, regulation, compliance, reversals, freezing, these types of things to commerce because we need those things in order for this to function in a global market. Uh, and the good news is not only is it being done, uh, it, there's uh, more options to do this at a lower cost and a more global basis uh, in the new system than there ever was in the legacy system, which has lots of holes in it. Yes, and building on that, um, a point that I think was made earlier in a previous session is maybe divorcing ourselves from the idea that um, something being regulated is the natural, is original and natural state. By default, everything is unregulated and regulation catches up in some ways. Um, it's, it's always going to be, um, it's generally maybe going to be more reactive than proactive. So on that point, uh, Pierre, I'm going to come to you next. Um, what are the risks of allowing DeFi uh, to grow in an unregulated space? It's a very straightforward question. And the first thing on which the regulator needs to answer is to find a certain balance between too many regulations and no regulations whatsoever. And we see some tendency across the world between the different geographies. Uh, sometimes some states have way too many regulations and others no regulations at all. So the regulator will always be late compared 
to the entrepreneur. Re regulation needs time. It needs to see the technology emerging to the emerging to determine the usage and when you go to regulator, regulators should not regulate technology but the future usage and for that we need to know that on the DeFi we do not know the usage of tomorrow, we don't know uh, what's going to happen with the autonomous bank or um, with the autonomous banking operation so we need to find a middle ground between way too many regulations that would only protect the existing actors of the sector and no regulation uh, to protect and the two risk on the regulation and on a DeFi that would not be regulated. Uh, the first risk is uh, systematic between uh, too much centralizing and uh, that would not uh, uh, protect uh, the people who want, uh, for example, who are looking for index would not know the contract because they would not be able to read the smart contract. So Thus, he would be not protected, and the regulators are not uh, up to the standards. And that is why we have a decentralized finances. And the second point is very systematic, because when we come to say that the two systems, the traditional one and the decentralized one, cannot cohabitate and coexist, we need to transfer the activities towards the DeFi that could create a certain balance between these two finances if both can take advantage or can leverage from each other. Thank you. Uh, and then, um, Richard, coming to yourself. Um, as with anything, uh, DeFi, it's there's a lot of th other things around crypto, catches fire in a very real sense. A lot of interest, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of maybe hype, for want of a better word, way of putting it. Big question is where do we go from there? Um, how do we then? How can we effectively scale DeFi? Yeah, I think um, look, we look at it as as a as a similar cycle to a lot of other disruptive technology. That you have the pioneers, people like Charles, that create the technology at the early days and are surrounded by technologists, and slowly the group of users and people involved in the ecosystem continues to expand. And I think when we look at DeFi now, we still see there's a, what we would call a a native element to the key users of the DeFi ecosystem. There's still a certain technical knowledge that you need to navigate the space well and to really get the utility that it offers. And I think for it to scale from a technology that's serving a few million people to using a billion people, it, you really need that sort of uplift in accessibility. Um, and to get that uplift in accessibility, there's some simple things like you know easier, better user interfaces. Um, easier ways for people that care less about the technology they're using and they're using it not so much because they want to use something that's a blockchain or settled by a blockchain, but they're using something that provides better utility than the existing version of what they're using today. And I think that's where the space needs to get to, to really scale to those users. And a lot of that is just getting more comfortable with building user interfaces, getting more engineers that are experienced at building sharper front ends that have less clicks and get the technology to advance that those people that don't want to watch a YouTube video, just want a service, can approach the space and just use it as simply as they use the existing financial system today. Thanks, Richard. And then finally, this will, I'll put this to all four of you and uh, we're running a bit short of time. So um, answers as brief as possible, please. Um, Sam, um, I'll put this to you first. Um, is DeFi the biggest regulatory risk in the blockchain and crypto industry? Regulatory risk, and it's a place that needs more regulation than it has, and, and for which I, I think it's not clear exactly what form that will take. And so I don't want to sort of like undersell the extent to which I do think that's going to be a focal point eventually for it. Um, but I also think that it's a place, at least for now, where, uh, you know, it, the, uh, uh, the regulatory uh, sort of implications are somewhat uh, less immediate and going to be less impactful, at least in the short term, I think, than in a few other places. So I would guess that we're going to see more focus and controversy short term over markets regulation, uh, digital asset issuance, um, and stable coins. Uh, then we will over DeFi with DeFi coming, you know, over the next, say, five to 10 years, 
and uh, I, I think probably a slightly more nuanced environment uh, regulatorily by the time it becomes the biggest concern. Thank you, Sam. Um, Charles, same question. You know, I think it's actually one of the greatest regulatory opportunities of the 21st century. Uh, if you look at the legacy system, it doesn't work well. It's fragmented. Uh, there's a lot of gaming, like if you look at the Panama Papers, these things. It doesn't scale well, uh, so there's only certain things you can do at certain levels, and SMEs get screwed. Here, you're talking about one global marketplace where everything is open source, it's programmable, and ultimately, everybody learns from each other. So the things that are done here in Dubai, for example, can inform and teach the Securities Exchange Commission. The things that are done in Luxembourg or in Switzerland can inform and teach the entire European Union, and people can adopt each other's work. And even entrepreneurs are participants in that. So while it's scary and it's new and there are new challenges that are introduced, it's an opportunity to correct problems that have occurred over the last century and a half of modern financial regulation and ultimately make them more fair for everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm being told we are running out of time uh, very quickly. Um, so uh, same question. I want to get give Pierre and uh, Richard both a chance to speak, so answers very uh, brief chaps, please. Yeah, yourself first. Le, le principal enjeu, de... uh, the main challenge is not to translate uh, the regulations today uh, on the decentralized actors and decentralized actors because the facility of uh, these regulators is to translate the same regulations, but there is a paradigm to this technology. And the true difficulty remains for this regulator is to invent a new way to uh, create regulation based on the protocol and not on the control of uh, different individuals. Thanks, Pierre. And, uh, and Richard, final word to you. Yeah, I, I think J Charles's point is the most valid. I think that uh, whilst it is probably the biggest regulatory challenge, it's by far the biggest reward that the technology can offer as well. And we've always seen decentralised finance as that sort of key first use case that can really prove this technology's ability to, to reimagine um, and disrupt whole sectors. And the financial sector is, you know, the third, third, fourth or second biggest sector of almost every economy. So whilst I see it as a challenge, it's also the biggest opportunity, which means that regulators need to be very careful that um, they're helping to uh, you're helping a potential new, new new industry that can reshape financial systems to grow and prosper at the same time. Well, thanks all. Um, so Richard Galvin, Charles Hoskinson, Pierre Persson, and Sam Bankman-Free joining us virtually. Gentlemen, thank you to all of you, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks, gentlemen.